Greetings fellow 90s kids, I've spent my afternoon brainstorming about turning the LEGO Space themes from 1978 until around 2000 into a unified, coherent homebrew setting, and this is what I've come up with. I'm sure something like this has been attempted before, so if it has, feel free to discuss that as well. The LEGO themes from that era generally shared a narrative, but there's only so deep the lore gets for a series of toy blocks. I've tried to flesh them out a little bit to get kind of a basic idea of what a fully fledged RPG setting would look like, but it's just a basic skeleton. I don't have a particular system in mind, but something like Genesis could do the job. I'll go into the lore in a sec, but here are my general observations about themes. In the spirit of being inspired by kids toys, the setting would be generally upbeat and adventurous but with some cyberpunk undertones. Guns don't shoot bullets. They shoot flashy lasers. The bad guys aren't murderous psychopaths, they're spies and thieves. Violence and vulgarity still exists, but this isn't a dark reboot. The goal is to maintain the spirit of the source material. All the figures are wearing space suits and there's not a plant or animal to be seen. To me, this says deep space colonization in a galaxy where terraforming doesn't exist or isn't effective, or hasn't had time to work yet. This might not be ubiquitously true, but generally speaking, most colonies would be sealed habitats with maybe smaller to moderate sized cities on the more populated worlds. That said, I see it as mostly post-scarcity, the people in the colonies don't so much worry about where their next meal is coming from, but they do worry about being caught outside with a cracked helmet. The earlier classic space sets, the future and sets, and space police eye sets all wear very similar uniforms. Blacktron had a massive style change between Blacktron 1 and 2. These things are noted in the lore framework. LEGO kept making space sets well past 2000, but they stopped being part of the same canon. For the purposes of this, anything after Rock Raiders is considered a different setting. I'm even hesitant about including RR. So here's my very, very basic framework. Futuron is one of the great mega corporations of Earth. Earth itself may not be dead or abandoned, but it is distant and mostly irrelevant. Think Starcraft. Ages ago, Futuron set forth to colonize deep space. The early, classic space sets represent the early days of the colonies, when you lived, breathed, and died a Futuron employee, with the space police I sets being the early security division of Futuron. These days, while Futuron is still the biggest influence in the colonies, they are not alone. Now that the colonies are beginning to thrive, more corporate interests have begun to move in, establishing rivalries or partnerships with each other and Futuron. In the interest of establishing a neutral, third-party judiciary force, the colonies created the Space Police, Space Police 2, though Futuron still maintains its own security force with whom they occasionally butt heads. Blacktron I started as an off-the-books black agency under Futuron, doing shady secret bad guy stuff. Blacktron was a nickname that stuck, originally a portmanteau of Black Futuron. There was an incident, a scandal of some sort, that exposed Blacktron, and Futuron cut them loose to save face and distance themselves from whatever the controversy was. But doing so seriously weakened the economic and political standing of Futuron. In the modern day, Blacktron, represented by Blacktron 2, has embraced their exposure and Futurin's bad press, and has established themselves as a legitimate rival corporation, aggressively moving to acquire Futurin assets and colonies. They claim to have cleaned up their act, but their shift tf. Think Cerberus and the Mass Effect franchise, M. Tron is a corp that's moved and built itself up as a major labor and engineering interest, mining vast resources with their proprietary magnetron technology. They're rivals with Futuron, but mostly peaceful. Spirius is a group of outlaws and pirates operating from the planet of the same name. Spirius, they are the ostensible main villains but they have more in common with groups like Cobra, Gijo, or Hydra Aim, Marvel, than a full-on rival military. Their MO is mostly espionage and subterfuge with a healthy dose of piracy and theft. Ice Planet is. An ice planet. Probably a subdivision of future and performing science on an ice planet. For being the coolest dudes, they don't have much lore but their emblem does resemble an icy future and emblem. Unitron is a PMC that can protect your interests without asking as many questions as the space police. For a price. 
Robo forces a PNC that can protect your colony or perform search and rescue, also for a price. Most recently, the Exploring Corporation has arrived to investigate newly uncovered alien artifacts. This will eventually lead them into conflict with the Zataxons, aliens from the UFO sets, who are vicious conquerors, or into contact with the Holoxons, aliens from the insectoid sets, who are refugees from the Zataxons. If rock raiders fit, there'll be another, smaller scale mining interest, perhaps a crew of freelancers. So now that I've exceeded my autism quota, what are your thoughts should I put more work into this do you have anything to suggest? Add, change, first let's get the obvious reply out of the way orange transparent chains a second. This all sounds pretty cool and if you can get actual sets minifigs could be a fun campaign. Actual terrain you can disassemble, terraform and build on is cool. Third, we're on fucking TG. We have exceeded our autism quota roughly 200 years ago. Look at the art in the op, and imagine the entire Lego space of us re-imagine through that lens. Basically I'm treating it as a backdrop for a general sci-fi setting, which is to say that people are still flesh and blood and not made out of bricks. The seriousness I'd put somewhere around classic film serials and comics of the 1970s, or kids adventure cartoons from the 70s 90s. Future and being a sort of morally ambiguous megacorp version of Star Trek's Federation. Which is to say, the setting takes itself seriously, but the content is closer to PG than R. That's really just my take on it, though. I'm claiming no ownership over this, and if you want to throw out your own ideas of Grimdark Legavus or Super Campy Extra Fun Block Space I would absolutely encourage you to do that. I seriously doubt I will be able to convince my group to do this. But it definitely piques my autism. I like that the setting is so vast, but the technology is at a 90s futurism level, rather than sci-fi magic. It appeals to me a lot more than 40 wank or cyber shit. It's funny that some obscure Lego flavor text captures such an interesting space setting. My only concern is a lack of content, unless you were willing to break from the lore to make your own, which sort of takes away from the feeling that you're playing Legos with dice. For instance, what are the established planets colonies in this setting aside from Spirius and Ice Planet? Are there any other named planets or stations I really like that you can just play with Lego figures and blocks instead of traditional miniatures and terrain? It makes it cheap and easy, as well as allowing for a much larger variety of scenarios as well as keeping the childish feel of playing with Legos. Feel free to dump more of the sets that are inspiring you. What if the orange transparent piece is a hard light some sort of deployable chip that allows mass production infinite use of necessary items using the op image? The dude has a chain blade for ice clearing, skis, and a protective visor HUD. Blacktron survived primarily on the recreation of Fultron quality level light chips using what they had managed to take with them after their spiration from Fultron. This was blatantly done, but as Fultron developed farther and farther ahead in terms of quality and technical design, Fultron developed a near identical light chips system, giving off red light rather than orange. While there is no meaningful performance difference between the two, an individual's color hue is often all one needs to know about their personality. Yeah, I definitely like HL as a concept but I think it needs to have some degree of permanence. I think having it switch on off and or being easily malleable, green lantern style, diverts away too much from the classic idea. I want to keep a version of it, though, so I'll post more about it shortly. Hard light is a lightweight, resilient, and versatile glass-like material formed from coherent energy. It is the hand wavium miracle material that is at the center of the science that makes the colonization of deep space possible. The early future and expeditions only possessed rudimentary hard light technology, peep the classic space sets, but resources from the star cluster and advancements in technology have turned it into a part of everyday life. The fabrication of hard light used to be a proprietary technology which only Futuron knew how to do, but the secrets of its manufacturer leaked after Blacktron was excised from the company. This in turn broke some of Futuron's hold on the colonies as where once they had a monopoly on the sole piece of technology running the system, now other corporations have the opportunity to move in and rock the boat. But just because anybody can build hard light, not everybody has the resources to do so, and not everybody can do it well. It takes large factories, powered by energy crystals, to create the base material. 
Futurin is still the top dog in the sector, and that's not likely to change. Hardlight itself is semi-persistent. In its raw form, it is a malleable, viscous substance with little rigidity. It requires the application of science beams, a light quench, to harden it into a persistent structure. Once forged and quenched, hardlight objects keep their shape as long as they remain energized. Separate a hardlight structure from its energy source and it will slowly weaken over the course of hours or days, shatter, and eventually dissipate back into pure light as the containment field destabilizes. This is why we can see hardlight tools being used without a power source or interface, but rarely see entire structures made of the material. Editors note, I like the idea of them being loose bricks instead of something that can be switched on and off. Hardlight can be repaired by re-energizing it with an energy beam the way one might use a welding torch to repair metal, able to consistently return to its full strength. It can be recycled and reshaped to form different structures, and while this is often less expensive than forging brand new structures, it requires time and special equipment and thus isn't possible to do in the field. Scavengers will often scour wreckage for still coherent hardlight pieces, rushing to gather them before they dissipate, so they can resell them to hardlight reclaimers. This is a practice that the corporations try to discourage, because they can't tax it. Space travel warp drives work by doing some science shit with hard light. Propulsion still happens in real space, but due to science fuckery still allows ships to reach faster than light speeds in open space. However, space is vast, and even the fastest warp ships can take several days to reach the closest neighboring star system. Travel back to inhabited Earth space takes decades. Futurin created the first jump get, Bulget, out of Earth space. It operates much like suggests, by deconstructing an object into pieces, beaming them through, brick space, and reconstructing the object at the destination. This process is not infallible, but it cuts the travel time to the nearest inhabited star sector from decades down to months. The sole jump gut in the colonies is run, of course, by Futurin, but they do license its use out to other corporations, and heavily tax it. If a corporation were to build another jump gut, it could cause a massive paradigm shift in the balance of power. Editors note, I want to keep Earth and other inhabited space a distant thought, to keep the setting grounded in the colonies. Leaving the colonies and escaping the corporations is outside most people's means. I'm thinking that gates can't transport living material at all, and are thus far only able to transport tools, supplies, and communications. The initial colonists only arrived via warp-powered sleeper ships, and now that they are here, there's no way to leave, or come back, without making another decades long trek through empty space. New colony ships arrive every so often, but until the problem of shipping organics through bulgets is solved, for most people it becomes a one way trip. Maybe just cut the warp travel down to a few years and gate travel to days weeks. IDK. AI. Service robots are somewhat common, if you look at the sets. There are quite a few that come with non-minifig robots, heuristic, adaptable, learning androids or not. Spirius was the first to crack the problem of a smart droid, and for years they were the only ones. There are even some rumors that they are lead by one such droid. The Explorine Corporation has recently rolled out their own model of highly advanced smart droid for use in their expeditions, though, and nobody else is quite sure how they managed to do it. Editor. Spirius and Explorines were the only human sets to have android minifigs, aliens. Humanity made first contact with extraterrestrial life over a century ago on their Mars colony. While much of that information has been classified, read, ICBA, this is what is known. Martians were peaceful, technologically advanced, but dying. After establishing communication and sharing knowledge, such as the early secrets of hardlight tech, the Crystallines attacked. Crystallines were a race of hard, translucent crystal beings that were just really, really rude. They waged war with Earth and the remnants of Martian civilization to settle an old grudge. Some believe they were an artificial race created by the Martians themselves, made of actual living hard light. In the end, Earth won, but both the Martians and Crystallines were wiped out. Or were they? What Earth learned from the conflict allowed Futurin to become the prevailing megacorp 
and open up the possibility of interstellar travel and eventually the construction of the first Bulljurt. Meanwhile, in another galaxy, the aliens of Zataksha wage a bloody civil war. The Zataxans are another race of persistent, hardlight-based life forms with highly advanced technology. Being hardlight-based, they can travel through Bulj space unhindered. A large faction of refugees from this civil war fled their home galaxy, and ended up in ours, building a new home beneath the surface of the planet Haloksha. Haloksha, on the surface, is a barren and rocky world, but underneath the crust are layers and layers of caverns surrounding an inner sun. These caves maintain an ecosystem dominated by massive, hard light and silicon based insects, dubbed Bilgian bugs. The Zataxan refugees, now calling themselves Haloxans, subtly changed by the planet's energies, were forced to adapt to this new environment by reposing their vehicles to mimic the forms of the Bilgian bugs in order to traverse the subsurface world of Haloksha unmolested. Their vehicles are powered by volt stones, energy crystals able to recharge themselves in the rays of the inner sun, designed to look like Bilgian bug eggs so they may be placed and charged in the bugs nests unnoticed. The life of a Haloxan is tough and unforgiving, but it is a life free from their former oppressors. Or it has been, for the past several generations, but the Zataxan military has never given up the search for their former enemies, and their general has recently arrived from their home galaxy to find them and bring them back under Zataxan rule. Zataxans equals UFO sets, Haloxans equals insectoid sets. It's only a matter of time before the general finds them, or the colonies. The colonies are unaware of this, and of any extraterrestrial life for that matter. After the Mars conflict, humanity has not made first contact with any new civilizations. Recently, though, the Exploring Corporation has arrived in system studying what appear to be strange alien fossils. The Exploring seem more interested in peaceful exploration, but do they have a hidden motive their technology appears to be more advanced than that of Futuron and the other core? What's their real story how did they break the secret of smart androids and what's the story with these fossils what aren't they telling those are things I figure are better as plot hooks, but I think in general terms, the fossils are of an older race, perhaps the taxons perhaps precursors, that to themselves a hard light silicon based life. Studying the fossils are what broke the code of creating smart androids and unlocking new secrets to hard light, and that's why the explorines are so good at it. Also, I think Spirius was able to kitbash their droids together years ago this same way, perhaps after discovering and rebuilding Rex attacks and insectoid tech droids. And perhaps that's why they're able to pump out robots like nobody's business. That's what I've got so far. As usual, comments, critiques, suggestions, etc. are all welcome. I consider this a community project more than mine and I wouldn't have come up with half of this if you guys hadn't shown up. Next I think I'll work on fleshing out individual factions. So get those ideas out there also. All terminology is pending. Things like Bill Gates CTC are mostly placeholders. Miscellaneous shit. I should add, I'm envisioning the colonies being a collection of maybe a dozen stars. Surrounding the central Bill Gate, which is the most densely populated and the seat of future and strength. Further outward expansion is hindered only by supplier lines to and from the build gate. Uninhabited star systems aren't inaccessible, they are just further away. Planet Spirius sits hidden at the edge of what is currently colonized. Haloksha is outside the colonies, but close enough that someone like the Explorines could discover them. The Zataxans are searching for them, and are likely to start a conflict with anybody else they encounter. Any conflict would inevitably spill into the colonies. But these are the looming, mysterious threats rather than the clear and present danger. Exploring Corp might have secret crystallines in captivity. Futurin might have secret Martians kept alive back home. Spirius might be lead by a droid. And that droid might be an ancient and malfunctioning repaired Zataxan. Or Haloxan. Or a named precursor. Tech droid. It might be pulling a Skynet style long con against the colonies. Or none of these things are true, they are just some potential plot hooks. What if I wanna have underwater adventures? Perhaps the initial push for space colonizing came about because Earth suffered a catastrophic environmental collapse, complete with massive sea level rises. A few hardy souls remained on Earth, eventually making use of the technological advances and power generation, 
Hard light and sealed environments to begin reclaiming the planet. In turn, the development in deep sea habitats and diving vessels have allowed new colonies to be formed off world on aquatic worlds which were formerly uninhabitable. Alongside the official underwater colonies, pirate raiders, scavengers and other, weirdo factions have developed. A bunch of autistic neckbirds theory crafting and world building an entire setting based on Lego sets that were released when I was a kid fuck I love you guys. I absolutely love this idea as a Saturn. I would love to be able to do it, but I know, I just know that my group would never be up for it. I did have quite a few of these sets myself, and fuck me, I loved them so much. I was really back into Lego as a child, and I'm sure that's the same for most people. So, like, you know, the idea of being able to turn it into, like, you know, a tabletop game, I think is fucking outstanding. And, like, I love the way, like, you wouldn't even need to like paint anything or do anything with models or fuck all. You would need to actually just literally buy the old sets off eBay and that's about it and work away. You know, I think oh, I think it'd be really cool. Um, of course, not many people will be up for it, but like, let us know if you guys try it out. Definitely come back and let us know how it went because I just want to know. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, I'm gonna stop now before I keep rambling on about fucking Lego for the rest of the day. Um, hope you boys enjoyed. I really like this. I haven't done like a thread style simulator video in a long time, so I thought it'd be something a bit of a change, sure. But anyway, like, let us know down below. Talk to you later.